All right, thank you everybody for coming to Glory Road today and thank you for, for having your ears open and your eyes open to hear something from God's Word maybe you've not heard before. Take what I say as life, receive it, put it in your mind, in your hearts, uh, keep it before your, in your mouth, keep saying it, see it. Learn to talk the way I'm talking. Learn to talk as though the Word has life in it. Okay, that's very, very important. Today we're going to be uh, asking the question, how do you exercise? Huh? <laughs> you mean to tell me the preacher's turned into, <laughs> turned into a Jack LaLanne here and <laughs> start exercising? No, no, no. I probably won't be doing that for a long time. Uh, no, I, we're talking about how do you function? How do you exercise? When you have a, uh, your phone, your phone exercises. It completes tasks. It does things that you ask it to do. It's exercising in what it was created to do. Exercising from the sense of when your teacher gives you an exercise. That's saying to give you a project, gives you an assignment, and you're to actually accomplish that assignment. So how do you exercise? How do you function? So let's go over here to Acts chapter 24. We'll start reading in verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Now, what is your confession based on? What is it that is the root of your speaking? What is the foundation? What's the force behind your words? What motivates you in the morning? What causes you to get up and want to function? What is it? What is it that causes you to, to think what you think? To say what you say? To feel what you feel. Notice this. Paul said in his 14th verse, But this I confess unto thee. Now he's standing in front of, of a lot of important people here in this chapter. And uh, he's standing in front of governors here. And so he is confessing unto them. I mean, when you're standing in front of important people, what you're getting ready to say... You better not be jerking around. You better get to the point. <laughs> you know? And he's standing in front of important people and he's saying, This I confess unto you. Remember over there, I think it's in the book of Philippians where he said, There's one thing that I have understood and apprehended over all things, and that is to forget those things in the past and to press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I mean, he basically put in a nutshell what was the most important thing he learned. And that is you can't move forward as long as you keep looking backwards. You can't live in life as long as you're focused on death. You've got to have something, a new focus, so it changes the way you function. This is what repentance really is. Change the way you think so you can change your outcome. If you change the way you think, you're going to change your results. You're going to change the way you do things. So as long as you think the same way you thought yesterday, you're never going to change your results. You're not going to change the way you, you function in life. So we have to find out how are we supposed to confess? What are we supposed to say? But listen to what he said. He said, I confess unto you that after the way, which they call heresy. Now, what is this way? See, you've got to identify what the way is. Remember what Jesus said? I am. You, you just put that in the parentheses if you want. I am. What is I am? I am is the name of God. It's his name for the memorial for all men. In his name is his life, his identity. Everything is in I am. Your future is in I am. It's not in I am not. <laughs> you know, not, not unless what you want in your future is nothing. 
<laughs> but, if, but if you want something, you have to say, I am. I am more than a conqueror. I triumph in Christ. I am. I am blessed. I am healed. I am prosperous. You've got to put, put that in your equation. So he says, I am after the way. Jesus said, I am. Here it is. That's the way. I am the way. What is the way? You're going to find it in I am. He also said I am is the way. It's the truth. It's the truth. Your loins are to be girt about with truth. Everything on the inside of you, all of the workings on the inside should be governed by truth. What's the truth? It's the way. What is that? I am. Your identity, your position as a son of God is I am. It's the way, the truth, and here it is in a nutshell, is the life of God. It's the life of I am. It is the life of the divine nature of Christ in you. And that's what he preached, and some called it heresy. Who called it heresy? All the religious folk. <laughs> Now, the, the commoners didn't know anything about all the religion because they were too busy working. They were too busy trying to make ends meet. They weren't, they weren't worried about all the religious side. It's, it's like the just are the religious and the unjust are the commoners out there just trying to survive. You know, they're not giving a whole lot of attention to religion. But the commoners didn't call Paul a heretic. It was only the religious people that did. Why? Because the commoners were the ones that were out there looking for all the help they could possibly get. They were the ones trying to function. They were the ones trying to, to not just make ends meet. They're trying to find the way. They're trying to find the way to a better, what? Life. Isn't that what everybody's trying to do? Oh, we're just trying to make ends meet. We're trying to have a better life here. Son, go to college because I didn't go to college. Now go because you'll find that if you do, you'll have a better life. You'll have more opportunity, more money, more this and more that. Why? So you can have a better life. But that's not what God says. God says the better life, the better way, and the truth about the way and the life is called I am. And so Paul caught this. He understood this. So he said, but this I confess unto you. So who are you confessing unto? When they come to you and want to know, hey, who's going to solve this problem? I am. You saying that or, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to sit here and wait for somebody. Because <laughs> we, we're in a hole. we got to get out of here we got to wait for God to send some hooker crook, <laughs> you know, and, and make this thing work, you know. But no, he didn't say that. He said, which they call heresy, so worship I God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Now, you have to catch what he's saying here. He's not telling us that all the laws of God and all of those laws that we are to keep, that that's the way, the truth, and the life. we got to keep all those laws. First of all, you can't do it, neither can I. But you have to understand, the reason God gave those laws was to point man to the life of God. But to show man, this is what you'd have to do. Naturally, is you're going to have to keep all of these laws if you want the way to the life of God. If you want to walk in truth, you're going to have to keep all these laws. Well, they couldn't keep it. So the law themselves and the prophets were prophesying about a life that was to come. If you want to enter into that life right now, you're going to have to keep all these laws. Well, they couldn't keep it. So they died. But they were pointing to the Messiah that would come and show us again, put, us, put in front of us the magnitude of the power of the life of I am. And if we would focus on Him, we'd begin to see the power of that life. Then we just have to receive from Him what He showed us. And, and so He's saying the laws and the prophets were prophesying about this way, this truth, and this life. But the religious, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, thought you had to actually keep the laws, and there was no other way. You had to keep it. There's no other way. And in the Old Testament, there really wasn't another way. You had to really follow the prophet and do what the prophet said. If you wanted to enter into life, you had to do what that prophet said. 
Now, I tell you right now, you can bypass the laws if you do follow the word of the prophet. The prophet's always going to give you and point you to the direction of using words to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. The law, Old Testament law just kept you busy doing works. Sacrifices, you know, doing all of those things, you know, and, and, and praying hard and praying several times a day and, and then getting, you know, doing good works. Now, that, that could never get you saved. It never did for anybody. They all died. But if you could follow the word of a prophet who would speak words and then you'd come up under the direction of those words and do what they say, that life would be imparted. Life would come alive and it would engage heaven upon earth. So Paul understood this, what the, the law and the prophets was pointing to. Verse 15, And because of this, he said, And I have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow. See, even the religious folk are doing all the work in hopes that they can one day die and go to heaven. So they want another life. They want hope, you see. See, they want to be able to have life and life more abundantly. They're just doing it through the laws. But they do have a hope that one day if they work hard enough, that God will be pleased with them and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come on up here. You did pretty good. You did things others wouldn't do. So thank God. I appreciate you. Come on up here. You know. But they have, he had a hope towards God. Now this hope is found in Colossians 1.27. It says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Glory is the life. It's the righteousness of God. It's, it's God's expression of His power, might, divine nature in your life into this natural world. That's what they had a hope of. They had a hope that something was going to change. <laughs> and it was going to be a God, God's life infused into a situation or a circumstance that would bring about the change. So, but notice all the people talked about Paul. He's a heretic. Do people talk against what you preach? Or do you not preach at all? Well, I mean, I, I don't think everybody's called to preach. I think, you know, you know we just have special anointed ones. <laughs> if you can open up your mouth and talk, or if you can write, you can proclaim the Word. You can speak. You can preach. And we're all called to minister the life of God through that. See, the message that Jesus preached upset the most religious people of His day. If you're preaching or you're ministering the Word or you're doing sending messages on TikTok, is it creating some kind of ruckus? Or is everybody just giving you a thumbs up and a smiley face and say, love it? If that's the case, you probably ain't preaching anything that's ruffling any feathers. Jesus' message was not a socially acceptable message. It came to bring about change. When He came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Most religious folks said, huh, excuse me. If you're preaching in a Christian church and everybody in the Christian church is saying, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Because your message sounds like somebody, some other pastor's message, then you're probably preaching something that's socially acceptable. Is your message socially acceptable? If it is, it's wrong. I'm going to tell you that right now. If you're just getting in the hand claps and doing all that stuff, it's wrong. What you should be doing, especially in the thinking of people saying, hold on a second now, because if it's not invoking some kind of change in the way they think, and it doesn't cause that, it doesn't cause them to question where they've been, then they're probably never going to have a new destination to get to. And they'll get satisfied with where they've been. And I found out that most people are tired of where they've been. But they don't want to. They don't want to change. Why? Because they don't. They want to hear something that's socially acceptable. It's like I've said this many times on, on my lives. Is that here you had the ten spies that were sent, uh, I'm, the twelve spies that were sent to to go in into Canaan land and 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 spy out the land. Ten came back with a message that was socially acceptable for everybody. Oh yeah, they're giants in the land, and we're like little grasshoppers in our sight and in theirs. We can't take the land. But two, Joshua and Caleb came back and gave a report. And their report was, hey, I know there's giants in the land and they're big and they look scary. But the fact is, if God said it, I believe it, that settles it, we can take it, let's go. The land's already been given to us, let's go, let's go possess it. See, you, the ten spies were coming back and they were telling people who were not warriors. So their, their message was socially acceptable to them. Well, we're not going to go. We're, we're just little loopy dupes here. We can't do nothing. I mean, we just, we, we, 
uh-uh. But they came back, what the Bible says is an evil report. It's not one that sounds like God. It's, it's one that, that would rather go into the town and be conformable to their thinking. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a big land and all, but, uh, but we just need to go there and find out, you know, if we can, can stay there a while so we can, you know, work for them and, and, and we can work their land and, and kind of get favor from them and socially acceptable. Yeah, I'm going to go and pastor a church and I'm going to find out, you know, what they believe and then I'm going to kind of preach what they believe so I can be socially acceptable so they can hire me and I can get paid. And I can sound like the last preacher they had, you know, and preach the same kind of message. That is wrong. It never produces change and that's what we have consistently in the church. Cut the TV on and everybody's preaching things that are socially acceptable, kind of get your emotions up, but they don't tell you the they don't tell you that if you can do all that sociable stuff and you're still going to die. But if they're not saying anything to you that's going to invoke any kind of change, then they become part of this, this idea that we're just going to continue what has always been. Well, when's the Lord going to come? Well, things have got to change. Well, think, when are things going to change? Well, I don't know. In God's own good time, I guess when He pushes that button and it's time to go, I guess He'll change it. See, see, death is socially acceptable. So if you are not preaching, you will live and not die, then you are not causing any heads to turn your way. I got a lot of people telling me I'm wrong. Well, I wonder why. Because the message is not socially acceptable to them. They think I'm wrong. <laughs> and, and the thing is, I've, I've preached what they preach. I have, I have believed what they believed uh, for years. Never produce anything except me working really, really hard. And it doesn't give any man hope like the Bible talks about. You can't save people from death by preaching death. You're going to have to step in there and talk about what Paul talked about, and that is having a hope toward God and toward men. He said that in verse 15, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Now, catch what he's saying here. you you got to catch this because a lot of times we're thinking of, okay, there's a resurrection of life and a resurrection to death, and they're both going to be judged. Listen to this. Please catch this because if you, if you, if you don't, you're going to stick with that thinking. And therefore, you're going to think you're the righteous and those others are unjust. Mm -hmm. And you're always going to be judging them. You can't give life to people you're already judging. Because if you're judging them, they're not going to hear your words. What he's saying is this. The resurrection from the dead is talking about the power to get death off of every human being and every living thing to get death off of it. Who is this resurrection meant for? Well, it's meant for who? The just and the unjust. Did he not say he reigned on the evil and the good? He didn't say where the good deserved it and the evil didn't. He's talking about the power of his reigning life will reign on the good and the evil. What's he saying? That if you're evil, you don't have to be accountable for anything? No, no. What he's saying is that life, resurrection life, resurrection Re means again. Surrection means to stand. So resurrection life means to stand again. It just means to stand up again. Arise and shine, your light is come. That life is available to the just and the unjust right now. It's available to the believer and the unbeliever. That life is available. It's available to anybody. The only reason the unbeliever can't access it because they got changed the way they think. But the life itself is not judging them. The life is saying, I'm here. Just change the way you think about it. Stop judging yourself based on the things you've done wrong or what somebody else tells you or what religion tells you. Get rid of that thinking. You see, gravity doesn't pick and choose who's going to operate in it. It can operate for the righteous and it can operate, operate for the unrighteous. As a matter of fact, when you're walking down the street and you're looking at everybody, and they're stepping down, you know, the curb to go across the street. You can't tell whether gravity that's causing them to actually step off that curb, if their people are righteous or they're unrighteous. You just know that gravity's working with all of them. 
See, religion wants to take and judge people. Mm, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going... Uh-huh, you're drunk last night, huh? Okay, all right, well, I'll get the prayer team to pray for you. You know, and that kind of thing. No, no, no. See, life works for the just and the unjust. The just aren't people that are doing good things. The just are people who have had their eyes open and understand how the law works. That's the only thing that makes them just. That's the only thing that makes them righteous in the eyes of God because they're working right. They're exercising themselves right. The unjust are not just because they're evil people. It's because they don't know the law and we don't have believers go telling them about the law. We have believers telling them about Jesus, but not the law. That's like me telling you all about the curb, but I never tell you about the gravity that'll help you get off the curb and go across the street. <laughs> you know, I never teach them about the things that can help them live life. I just talk about the curb. Isn't it a wonderful curb? And when I tell people about Jesus, that's all I'm basically doing, telling them about the curb. Isn't that wonderful? That curb is beautiful. He's a door, you know. Look at how pretty the door is. Yeah, he stands at the door. But look at that door. Isn't it wonderful? I'm not doing anything. I got to tell them about the life they can go through the door, you know, and get people to see things like that. If not, then, then all we're doing is giving religion and we're not functioning the way we're supposed to function. You and I are not to point the finger at people. Well, I'll tell you one thing. No, what we are to do is to first of all say, I am the way, the truth, I am the life. And believe it in your heart, confess it with your mouth so you start producing life. You start producing solution for your life. People start looking at you going, how are you getting, how is that? I know you don't, I don't understand. And they come to you and ask, what do you have? Well, this is what I have. I have life. Would you like to live and not die? Would you like to have a power on the inside of you that's working for you and not against you? Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you, you have that power in you right now. You already have it. I'm just going to open up the door, you know, wash the window so you can see it. And once you see it, all you got to do is, is believe it, live it. Start exercising and talking words of life. Start functioning the way you were meant to. But I don't say, man, well, no, oh, you got to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You got to go to church, give you tithe, give a sing song, get into the choir, hand out some tracts, and get out there and try to prove to humanity that you've changed. Then God might. You never know what God's going to do. He might knock you in the head with cancer and then try to tell you you're still doing something wrong. That's how we have a picture of God. God's out there knocking people in the head because they're doing wrong all the time. God's only concerned with one thing. Will you function like He created you to function? Will you change the way you think about the way you are to live? Will you pay attention to His words of life so you can enter into His life? You know, the life you have in you right now, you just got to... It's like you have life. You just need to look at the owner's manual to figure out how you function. <laughs> you know... I mean, if you get something technical, a gift or something, you don't know how to operate in it. I mean, you go to the user manual, right? The only reason you're reading the user manual is so you can learn how to function in this thing and make this thing work the way it's supposed to. Most of us are living, we're, we're, at, we're operating in life, but we're not living right. We're not functioning the way we're supposed to because nobody's going to the owner's manual. <laughs> no, one, no one is listening for the voice of God to, to find out what he says so they can step into it. Now let's go to, well, we went to Colossians. I told you about Colossians 1.27. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Now remember, this is, this is what he was saying here. Hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, and they, they, there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the just, uh, unjust. In other words, resurrection power is available to anybody that will believe, just or unjust. God's not just, see, God's not giving you his life based on your good works. He's giving you life because he died for everybody and gave it to them. And there it is. It's up for grabs, buddy. His work's already finished. He puts the preachers out there supposed to be preaching about the life and they've been preaching about Jesus or been preaching about a religion or preaching about an afterlife. And the whole time people are dying hoping God will sometime give them the life. And it just doesn't work that way. And I just want people to understand this. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verse 4. Listen to this. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. What is this hope? It's the hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection. 
There's a power going to cause people to stand up again. There's a power available to you to live and not die. That's the hope. That's the one calling everyone has been called to. That's the only thing that's going to give a man hope. As a matter of fact, if you just read over here, it said this. Oh, let me find it real quick. I think it's in the book of Philippians or uh, Ephesians. Oh, yeah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ or without hope, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. See, if you have no hope, then you have no God to manifest in there. You have none of His miraculous power. You don't have His life if you have no hope. No hope of what? The calling. What's the calling? His power towards you that Ephesians chapter 1 tells us about. His power towards you. Power of what? Power to live. His power of life. The power of an endless life. See, that the book of Hebrews, I think, talks about. The power of an endless life. Let's go to, to Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Now remember when Adam lost the glory, he became ashamed because he was uncovered. Uncovered with what? The glory or the life of God. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ, which is the life of God, shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or whether it be by death. Now listen, now I know, oh, see that. Notice that the life, see, when Christ is magnified in your life, it's either or into your person where Christ is magnified in you, the Father is glorified in the Son. Whether it be by life or by death, what he's saying this, when life shows up, people are going to, to notice it in one of two ways. They're going to see the life of God all over you or they're going to see death disappear. It's not whether I live or whether I die, Christ be magnified in my body. No, no, no. It's whether people see the life of God automatically or they just see death disappear, be swallowed up. He said, Christ will be magnified in my body. Because one of two things are going to happen. The life of God is going to manifest in the brightness of His glory or you're going to see death be swallowed up. Sickness leaves. See, that's whether it's by life or by death. He's not talking about dying and going to the ground. See, Paul even understood this. Death was not supposed to be in the equation. It was never in the equation of God's intention, ever. That was a decision man made. God's trying to get us back to the place where death is not in the equation. See, when he talks about dying to is gain, living but dying is gain, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you die to self, you become more alive to Christ in you. He's not talking about physically dying. That's what the church preaches, and that's what we've been conditioned in this world to think. We're supposed to die so we can be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. But I thought the Lord, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's the Lord right there. Is the Spirit of the Lord in you? Oh, hallelujah. Then His life ought to be shining in you. His life ought to be revealing the, the, the supernatural presence of God. If it's not, then that's what we press towards. We're pressing toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Every day ought to be a press towards the glory of God. Not pressing out here as in, oh God, we've got to press through these circumstances. No, it's about pressing inward, getting more and more to where your inner man governs your life instead of your outer man. Your outer man is pressing. Your outer man is desiring to walk in the light as he is in the light because that's where the glory's at. See? And the more we press toward that inner man, the more we're going to start wearing the glory. Let's go to Romans 8.23. I know I'm teaching a little bit longer today, but it's important that I get this over to you. Romans 8.23, and I'm hoping I'm not confusing anybody. I, <laughs> I hope you all understand what I'm saying here. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit or to know the redemption of the body. They desire to know the life, the resurrection power 
in this body. Go read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, 7, something like that. You're going to find out that's what Paul was waiting for. Everyone was waiting not to be, not to lose their body, but to have their body clothed upon from the inside with the glory of God. See, this is what Paul preached. Now, Paul, just like me, just like you, doesn't know everything. We've got knowledge in us, but we're pressing towards it. Paul didn't have anybody other than Christ, what he saw on the road to Damascus, just to, to, to know he could walk in life apart from death. He didn't have anybody no more than I have anybody. The difference is, is God's pouring out revelation in these last days that, get, that can equip us and help us to know who we are so we can actually walk this out. So let's go back over here to Acts chapter 24. And let's get to the, the meat of this thing. Verse 16, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. What's he saying here? How is he going to get all of this stuff to work? Remember he said in Philippians, Forgetting those things in the past, pressing toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God is you stepping into the power that He's made available to you in Christ that's in you. That's the high calling. Not to be a carpenter, a teacher, a violinist, or anything like that. That's not the high calling. That's just a platform to manifest on that platform the high calling of God, which is God showing up in you His power. But notice how Paul realized this is the way you do it. It's just, this is the thing we have to exercise, we have to work on. Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Now how, what is he saying? He's saying, remember he just got up here and he mentioned about the prophesying of the Messiah came through the law and the prophets. But the religious people have taken the law and the prophets and bound themselves by doing all those works, you know, following all those works, keeping all those sacrifices, you know, uh, just, you know, doing whatever we can do, fasting, just doing all this kind of stuff that makes us follow these rituals and religions and things like that. Not that there's anything wrong with fasting or anything wrong with trying to do good or keep the commandments. It's just you're not going to find life in it. But notice what he says. He says that I have to always have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now, if you're going to live by the, the Ten Commandments, you're always going to be locked up under the offense toward God and towards men. So what's he saying? He's saying, in order for me to have the right thinking to manifest the glory of God, I can't lock myself up under the law. I can't lock myself up under the, the, the rituals and all of the customs of the Old Testament because those are the things that become the strength to sin. The law is the strength of sin because you can't keep it, so you always fall short. That creates condemnation and a consciousness of sin, whether it's towards yourself or towards others because you're always comparing yourselves to others when you're under the law. Always. You're judging others, and as you judge others, you're condemning yourself. So he said the quickest way to walk in the hope of Christ, hope of God, the glory in you, is to get out from under the law so you can have a conscience that's free towards God and free towards men. It puts you in a place where you know that the only thing you can do for God is to reveal His life. And the only thing mankind needs is the life you possess. So that becomes your number one goal. That's how you begin to exercise yourself in things of righteousness. I hope I'm making sense here. What I'm telling you is, get off of the Old Testament commandments. Get, get off of all of that. Get yourself into the thinking of Christ, the life of God in you. If you do, you'll start functioning the way you're supposed to function. You'll get rid of the condemnation. You'll get rid of the judgment. You'll get rid of all of that stuff that judges others and judges yourself. Now you can have a mind that's free to live. And when you have a mind that's free to live, your body's going to follow right after it. So function the way you were designed to. Get out from under the law. Get out from under all the condemnation. Get out from under that self-guilt. You're not being measured by anyone else. 
until you find out who walks by life. The person that can live and death can't touch them, that's the one you want to get up under. You want to get up under that and become the shadow of that light. Get totally immersed into that thinking. And I guarantee you, all the other condemned, everybody that's been condemned, the just and the unjust will come running to you. Because the life is what everybody's looking for. Well, I sure hope you got something out of this today. Until we meet again, I'm Adam King. God bless you. Bye-bye.